to have him with us for the year and have him with us for the evening. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, my name's Eric Gordon, as, as, as Scott just said, and, and um, I've been, yeah, I've been uh, here for this year at MIT and, um, and really enjoying my time so far. So getting to speak in this forum is really uh, just, a, just an honor. So uh, let me share my screen and hopefully this will go well. Hold on one second. No. Do you see a, do you see a towards a meaningfully and efficient smart city slide? So you see, yep. Okay, good. And let me try this. All right. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, so my talk tonight is, uh, is entitled towards a meaningfully inefficient smart city. I will explain all those words, uh, in, in, in a bit. Uh, so please be patient with me as I do that. Um, as Scott mentioned, uh, I direct the engagement lab uh, at, at, uh, at, at Emerson, and, and we have focused on the intersection of, of, uh, of play and civic life for, for some time. And, um, and the work that I'm going to talk about tonight is both a, um, emerging out of, uh, out of the work that I've been doing for, for nearly a decade now, um, but, but also um, firmly tied to a recent book um, that I, I published in, in March, which I'll talk a little bit about. So let me start by telling you what you already know, that on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police officers. The next day, a video of the crime was circulated on social media and the city erupted in protests soon after. And within a week, throngs of people demanding racial justice took to city streets all over the country and the world. Soon after, a majority of Minneapolis city councilors pledged to defund the city's police department. And they said, we are here today, this is their pledge, we are here today to begin the process of ending the Minneapolis Police Department and creating a new transformative model for cultivating safety in Minneapolis. And since this time, it has largely fallen apart. There's such a sense of urgency around trying to start some sort of community engagement process that is staff-led and better embedded in the city enterprise, says uh, Councillor Bender. Um, so that it isn't just the policymakers having these separate conversations in our wards that aren't recorded or captured anywhere, so that we can help to build confidence in our community that we are moving forward in a way that reflects the complexity of the multiple layers of crisis. One resident of North Minneapolis, a predominantly black and brown neighborhood, had this to say about the effort. They didn't engage black and brown people referring to the city council members. And something about that does not sit right with me. Something about saying to the community, we need to make change together, but instead you leave this community and me unsafe. So the decision was given over to Minneapolis Charter, uh, to a Minneapolis Charter Commission, a mostly white appointed commission that decides matters of changes in the city's charter. And then last week, just last week, the commission has put the ballot initiative on pause and the city's relationship with the police department is about where it was in May. So this story is a complex morality tale. It's a story about the success of the movement for black lives, the mainstreaming of racial justice as a legitimate and essential concern for elected officials. It's also a story about the failure of procedures of governance to, faci to facilitate changes in policy the failure of institutions to adapt to sentiment. My talk today is about institutioning, the process by which interventions, big social movements or small programmatic designs transform the institutions that enable them. And while especially in the media disciplines, we tend to focus on large social movements and specific media interventions, the process of institutioning is often where lasting transformation is lo located. So Hoybrechts et al. argue that the engagement with procedures of institutions is necessary to repoliticize participatory and co-design practices. The missing link for progress is the transition from movement politics or specific interventions to sustainable institutional transformation. The example of Minneapolis is not unique. 
Over the last several months, U.S. cities have challenged their ability to govern with their stated values. And because of widespread social movements, these values are often newly discovered by policymakers. They, or they feel newly discovered by policymakers. It's, it's one thing for elected officials to call foul and make a decree. It is quite another to generate and enable the trust and social capacity necessary for systemic change. So this is the focus of my research. And I'm lucky enough to have it also be the focus of my teaching this semester. Uh, the co-design studio I'm teaching is focused on designing the mechanisms for communities to effectively co-create with city government in Boston. Uh, we have counselors Andrea Campbell and, and Julia Mejia are partners in the course, and both have expressed similar sentiments. The city council in Boston is more representative, representative of the city population than it ever has been. It's majority women and nearly half people of color, but the mechanics of governance have largely stayed the same. So our studio class has 11 community partners and it brings together students with city staff and community leaders to co-design mechanisms of collaborative governance in Boston. So why am I speaking about this in a media department and not a policy department? Because local governments, governance is mediated by digital and analog communication, from voting to town hall meetings to information dissemination and advocacy. And because media studies scholars, especially folks like me with a background in the humanities, have a great deal to say about the interface between expression, technology, and power, and the processes by which it is integrated inst into institutional logics. At a time when trust in government is at an all-time low, where nationalist and populist leaders are trafficking in misinformation campaigns, and diminishing trust in institutions is a feature, not a bug, it is difficult to have much faith in government. I acknowledge and share that concern. But I also understand the necessity of public institutions to provide access to goods and services to represent the various publics they govern. We might say this breaks down at scale. And, and in the contemporary environment of the United States, it is difficult to be an institutionalist on any scale. But when we examine progressive politics in the US and beyond, where struggles of democratic representation are inching towards legitimacy, that is happening on the local level. Cities are where, ne where nearly 60% of the world's population lives. And they are and have always been sites of contestation, and evolution in ways of living and governing. They are sites of social protest, they push boundaries of difference and tolerance, and they are sites of technological transformation that have perpetually altered how humans live together. As Georg Simmel said in the opening lines of his 1901 essay, The Metropolis and Mental Life, the deepest problems of modern life derive from the claim of the individual to preserve the autonomy and individuality of his existence in the face of overwhelming social forces, of historical heritage, of external culture, and of the technique of life. The city is the locus of phenomenological and corresponding institutional transformation. Simmel argues that the metropolis is where individuality through capitalist pursuit is placed in tension with the management of external stimuli and the throngs of social difference. I just realized I used the word throngs twice uh, in this talk. That's, that's special. Uh, he explains a coping mechanism that he calls the blase attitude, which enables the city dweller to adapt to an unprecedented inundation of stimuli. The city is a site of constant transformation. Individuals and groups develop filters through which to cope. And institutions need to evolve such that they are capable of governing within the conditions of rapid change. While Simmel doesn't use this phrase, this reality implies a certain intelligence defined by situational adaptability. It implies a smart city. Smart cities. It's a designation that has become a marketing catchphrase that positions competing municipalities in the global marketplace of innovation and creative economies. The label tends to invoke images of responsive technologies and efficient infrastructure. There are global smart cities competitions and mayors around the world are desperate to put this label on their place. I don't want to engage in the debate about the relative value of the smart city label. The critical arguments in this space are well rehearsed. I do, however, 
want to expand how we think about the emotional intelligence of cities, mostly as a site of experimentation, of collective pursuit, of new ways of living and governing. The city is an important unit of analysis because it marks the ability for institutions to make connections, act in good faith, build trust, be held accountable, and cultivate responsibility for something resembling a public good. Smart cities tend to focus on systems, prioritizing certain values of efficiency and ease. But if we go back to the example of Minneapolis, the promise of efficiency and ease placed in conflict with the messiness and complexity of the demands of emerging publics led to institutional inaction. Which leads me to the overarching question of this talk, what are the alternative logics of intelligence that might better explain and compel democratic urban transformation? So the shuttering of uh, the shuttering in May of Google Sidewalk Labs initiative in Toronto is instructive. The single provider model of a smart city where Google transformed an industrial area of Toronto's waterfront into a completely digitized, responsive and smart environment was an impressive vision of future urbanism. Its highly efficient infrastructure near complete social connectivity, usable interfaces for information access was a compelling representation of a smart city. Sidewalk Labs even held design workshops to involve members of the surrounding community to help shape outcomes. But as Shannon Maidern suggests, these workshops were largely performative and the well-funded operation overlooked the relational work necessary to distribute a sense of ownership in the process and build trust with those who had every reason to believe that their participation would not translate into having any real impact. Without an opportunity to be heard and have impact on the outcomes, it is not surprising that within the social restructuring prompted by the pandemic, this model of a future smart city would prove not to be desirable. The logics driving the vision of the future city were focused on optimizing for efficiency around understanding human behavior and were largely absent of values that would lead to a city built on trusting relationships and systems of caring for people's needs. In March, my book, Meaningful and Efficiencies, Civic Design in an Age of Digital Expediency was released. This book profiles civic designers or people within public sector and other public serving organizations who are typically working against dominant organizational cultures to craft human systems guided by relationships and care. Gabe Mugar and I tell stories of people from small news organizations seeking to transform the interface between audience and newsroom and people from municipal governments who are desperately deprioritizing a focus on streamlining service delivery by designing inefficiencies into systems as a means of shifting focus to the time and labor intensive work of building relational trust with historically marginalized communities. In February, I understood these practices as fringe, as subtle acts of resistance inside of public organizations, but today, the active pursuit of a values-based transformation has been mainstreamed. The pursuit is in no way straightforward. As we see in Minneapolis and Toronto, it is expensive. It often runs counter to common sense practices of incorporating technological efficiencies into antiquated organizational practices. And as a result, beyond initial platitudes, it is politically difficult to execute. Unlike past waves of public sector innovation, it cannot be addressed by a small batch of design thinking workshops or de by developing a new app. Cultural sensitivity training is not enough and quotas for increasing diversity fall short of addressing structural processes that perpetuate inequality. What is necessary is not just changing the appearance of governance as we are reminded of in Boston, it is necessary to change the logics that guide it. And so I point to meaningful inefficiencies, systems deliberately designed with Slack in order to hold space for a diversity of stakeholders, viewpoints, and emerging forms of governance. I compare this logic to that of a well-designed game, a system with clear goals, consistent feedback, and room to play. Opportunities for people to fail safely, experiment with solutions, and build relations within a constrained environment. Meaningfully inefficient programs and processes not only make engaging experiences, but when inside these systems, 
one can build the trust and relationships necessary for communities and organizations to thrive and care for the issues that matter to them. This is not an argument for more public meetings. The goal is not simply more dialogue. That is part of the goal, but it needs to be situated within a capture device that is capable of allowing reflection, learning, and growth. We need to be thinking about the systems of cities that enable them to become smart, to learn, to grow, to, gener to generate wisdom. So consider the Talmud, over 6,000 pages of rabbinical interpretation of the Torah, which has served as the guiding legal document for rabbinic Judaism. The ancient document captures interpretation born of a core text filled with ellipses, such that meaning can be made of the system's logic. In the center is the core text. On the right is Rashi's interpretation, and on the left is yet another interpretation, and then surrounded again by commentary on the interpretations. This spiral of knowledge capture is a structural solution to containing and learning from inefficiencies. So what does this look like on a city level? How can cities learn? They certainly can't be smart unless they are able to learn. And currently, the institutions mediating public life are not set up to be smart. They contain the mechanics of public life, which might include voting, protesting, tweeting, but they lack the ability to contain the interpretation of these mechanics, the listening, the evolution of novel ideas into agreed upon practices. So I have introduced a logic of meaningful inefficiencies to use a different, more familiar term um, that is descriptive of institutions that enable meaningful play, or we can talk about meaningful play. Um, and importantly, uh, we're able to learn from and evolve from that affective collective experience. So the philosopher Bernard Suits explains that to play a game is to achieve a specific state of affairs using only means permitted by rules where the rules prohibit the use of more efficient in favor of less efficient means and where rules are accepted just because they make possible such activity. Playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. So games are by definition then inefficient. It is in fact the inefficiency of these systems that cultivate and support the experience of play. So Suits famous example is the, is the game of golf where he he um, he talks about the most efficient way of getting the getting the little ball into the little hole is to pick up the little ball, walk over to the little hole, and drop it in. But instead, all these ops, these unnecessary obstacles are placed in the way that are that are inefficiencies that enable that play to happen. And we, um, by by agreeing to play the game of golf, you are voluntarily entering in um, to a system so that you can play, so that it enables play, and so. What, what the conclusion here is that the play is the affective quality of modern urban life that is necessary for shared understanding and collective care. Reshaping the mechanisms in which cities are governed to recognize and develop collective play is the goal of my research and design. So now I wanna talk about two current studies that are exploring emerging forms of governance in cities. The first is an experimental design project in the city of Boston, which is in collaboration with the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics, that explored a collaborative process for making decisions about new technologies in the public realm. And the second is an evaluation of an effort in Cluj, Napoca, Romania, wherein a loose structure of multi-sector collaboration is being formed to advance citywide efforts to enhance the well-being of youth. So I'm gonna talk about both of these projects uh, back to back. So the first one is Betablocks. So Betablocks is a project that um, was, uh, came together in 2018, 2019. It was funded by the Knight Foundation. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was in partnership with the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics and the architecture firm Supernormal. Um, and what we set out to do here was to, um, to address a, the, the core problem, which was the way in which technologies find their way into the public realm. So normally, technologies, cameras, sensors are installed in neighborhoods without any kind of public consultation. 
um, around uh, around that technology. So there is the there is the public sector, the government decision makers. There are the technology companies that tend to make deals with with one another, and the community for the most part uh, is left out of that decision making as to what technologies are in their space. And here I'm talking about public realm technologies, sidewalks, publicly held um, publicly held spaces. So beta blocks uh, essentially was was designed to invite some friction in this process. And it was a process to bring residents and organizers into the conversation um, between government and the technology companies. And now I'm gonna explain how we attempted to do that. There were five primary components um, to, this, to this intervention. Uh, an exploration zone, which was the site for experimentation, an advisory group that, that had oversight uh, of that zone, uh, a public exhibit that was uh, designed to encourage dialogue, uh, a specific youth curriculum that was designed to, to bring youth into the process specifically, and then ultimately recommendations, which was the collaborative governance um, function of this, of, of this prototype intervention. So let me go into some more detail. So in the city of Boston, we, I, we identified three, um, three neighborhoods where we, uh, where we set up exploration zones. There's Lower Alston, Chinatown, and Codman Square. These, uh, these areas were chosen um, based on a number of factors. We looked, at, we looked at need, we looked at the data to determine where there was need, but we also, there were also political factors, which was the government, in the case of this particular project, the government uh, helping us to decide where, the, um, where, where friction may be more or less uh, present. Um, and where we might have more traction within communities. So it was a sort of a it was a it was a complex process of selection. I can talk more about that later if people are interested. So the exploration zones were um, they're essentially four square blocks uh, that were uh, identified in the city, wherein um, uh, wherein um, permitting would be relaxed so that technologies could be temporarily installed within that within that area for the purpose of public scrutiny. Um, and as I said, the, um, the each of these zones was was governed by an advisory group that um, that we set up um, over the course of the project. So um, now the advisory groups were um, were we were, they were created in a number of different uh, in a number of different ways in the different communities. They were designed to include community leaders, volunteers, and youth. They met monthly while the zone was in place. Um, the goal was to match local priorities with with tech um, and to identify locations um, of the tech to be installed and provide feedback for those installations and then data policies and in, and then also feedback into business plans. So the part that I didn't mention is is that the other uh, actor or set of actors here are the tech companies and the tech companies had their tech that they would essentially lend to the project that could be temporarily installed so they were other stakeholders in this process and the community feedback was also part of the was the the business plan was open to feedback which is an important feature of this program so one of the companies that we worked with was a company called sufa uh, which is a startup out of boston actually originated uh, out of mit um, and it's, uh, it's essentially a solar powered uh, digital billboard um, that uh, the great feature of SUFA signs is that they don't need, um, they don't need an electrical outlet so they can be placed um, in, you know, you have more variety of where you can place them. Um, and uh, they, so they, they just be plopped down and then they feature, uh, they feature sort of local advertising, they feature municipal data, there's, a, there, it's very flexible as to what it is that, that can be featured. So SUFA partnered with us and lent us um, a number of their, um, of their signs and then these were located by the communities, by the advisory groups. Another company that we partnered with couldn't be more opposite. It was Microsoft, and um, in, in this case, we we worked with Microsoft, and there they had developed a new air quality sensor that we located um, in in that was located in, in each of the each of the different zones. One of the things I want to point out here is that, um, as you see here, there's a sign um, that is next to the air quality sensor that was that was uh, on the light post that the air quality sensor was hanging on that says this is an air quality sensor. This is the one in Chinatown, as you can tell. 
Um, this is an air quality sensor. Uh, this device is temporarily installed here to help understand its value for your neighborhood. And then it includes a phone number um, and a website um, to get feedback. And this was in addition, of course, to the, um, to the official ZAG or, or zone advisory group. So um, one of the tasks of the, of the advisory group was to locate the technologies. So we had the, um, we had the groups would meet and then determine the location of the sensors, the location of the signs, and, and we had other technologies as well as part of this pilot. Um, and so, and, and these were robust conversations often because they involved like, it was a sourcing of problems. Why would we need an air quality sensor here? Well, if we think we might have an issue here, then we should locate we should locate the air quality sensor in this neighborhood or in this corner. Um, why would we need a digital sign here? Let's locate it where there is particular pedestrian traffic that would, um, uh, that would actually make use of a sign. So these are the kinds of conversations that were happening in the zone advisory groups. So, okay, I'm gonna leave that, uh, I'm gonna sort of bracket that. So we had the exploration zones, we had the zone advisory groups, and then we also had a traveling exhibit. And this was designed to encourage public conversation about, uh, about the issues of technology in the public realm. One of the features of the traveling exhibit was this uh, nine by 18 um, uh, inflatable structure that we, we call the beta blob um, that, uh, that would, we could locate throughout the city and it became a site of, of exploration um, of, of these technologies. So, uh, in the wherever the beta blob was located, uh, you would first be greeted by by this rendition of a of a future and past city, um, and and we would ask questions such as um, how do you envision um, technology in your city or how do you use technology in your city, and we would sort of open it up immediately to some sort of um, some sort of dialogue. The the as you see here, we would put the the blob in public spaces. So here it is in the in the Rose Kennedy Greenway in Chinatown Park. Um, uh, we sometimes would call this a hug object because people would come up to it and hug it, uh, and and it, it it attracted people in that way. It had a it had a very inviting presence as it as it turns out, and it became a place to uh, kind of open up the conversation about about technology. Uh, one of the most popular features of this exhibit was uh, this board game um, that uh, that you see being played here, uh, that that always sort of drew crowds as we had uh, as we had the blob um, up around the city. Now again, the idea here is we're trying to create the sort of interface of like how we can create um, these kinds of conversations on a public on a public scale uh, that would actually lend itself to changing the way that um, that technologies are procured within uh, within the public realm. Here's another example in Codman Square, um, where the the blob became a site of picnicking uh, as well as playing the game. So it was it 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 sort of turned it it kind of picked up multiple functions as it moved about the city. Uh, the interesting thing about the blob is that it was um, it was quite difficult to um, to locate outside, uh, as you see, because uh, it could be blown away. So we had to we had we had to tether it down here to uh, to I think with six thousand pounds of bricks um, that it had to be tied down to that had to be sort of moved every time the the blob would move. So it was a it was a, a remarkable amount of effort um, to move this playful object around the city. Uh, and then it culminated in a um, in a uh, installation in City Hall, where we where we had the blob, and we um, and this was really for policymakers to see the kind of input that was happening around the city, uh, not only the, the results of all the the zone advisory groups, but also um, uh, but also the 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 results of the game, and then the game was there for people to play as well in City Hall. It was it was uh, placed there for over a week. I'll just say a little bit about the youth curriculum that, that also operated on the side. Um, this was a four part workshop series uh, for youth 14 to 20. Uh, it focused on data storytelling and visualization. And then the youth at the end of this created an infographic driven story um, using quantitative data to sort of tell, um, you know, tell these qualitative stories of how, uh, of how people are using um, data and technology in their place. Um, at the end of the of the zone advisory groups, there were recommendations that emerged, and this is an example of recommendations that that came from the uh, specifically about the Sufa sign in Chinatown. 
profit sharing with or financial contribution to the community. Oh, sorry. What conditions need to be met for super signs to be valuable for Chinatown? Profit sharing with or financial contribution to the community. Display relevant information to residents, community events, job opportunities, info about local businesses, clear and bilingual labels, and then operate at no financial cost um, to the community. So this is just one example of, of a community response to a particular tech. Now, I, I just want to remind you, tech was placed temporarily because permit it, permitting was only temporary. It was there for 60 days and then it was removed. Um, and so after that 60 days, there was this opportunity to provide this input after, after this um, lengthy process. Other things that I won't go into was a, a data policy that was also drafted by the um, by the zone advisory groups uh, that looked something like this, where principles that were collaboratively authored um, by the by the group, and then these these were to happen in each of the zones, and so this over time could lead to a data policy that was emergent, um, you know, from the from the different neighborhoods of the city. Okay, so here are the outcomes. Um, some of the outcomes. Um, it was, you know, years in the making. We developed a valuable model um, that is currently being explored by by other municipalities. However, the prototype was never able to integrate into governance structures, um, and because partly because our primary uh, partnership was with with the mayor's office, and we weren't able to fully integrate into other other units uh, within this city. So what was interesting about this project is that we focused on the infrastructure. We focused on the logics of the way that governance happens when it comes to making decisions about technology and the future of cities. Um, the result was mixed. The result was um, we had the, we, we created an interface, but the, but the um, kind of connective tissue wasn't there in this, in this prototype, or not yet, I should say. And it's one of the interesting things about doing work like this uh, is that even though we our our design goal was focused on um, was focused on governance, they may not have been the those weren't the immediate impacts um, of this project. And again, I can talk more about this about this later. Let me move on to another project, um, and I just want to just I I won't I don't have as much to say about this. This is a new project, a project called Our Cluj, um, and I'm going to see if um, actually I don't think my audio is connected. Can you hear that? No, okay. All right, I won't mess with it. Um, so the uh, Our Cluj is an initiative that was uh, started by a foundation um, called the Foundation Botnar. Um, it's actually a Swiss foundation. And uh, they made a commitment to, um, to the city of Cluj, Napoca, uh, for a, a 10, 10 year commitment to, to, um, to Cluj. Uh, and which is a sort of an unusual thing. Um, so the, the capital city, so Cluj-Napoca is the capital city of the Transylvania region, uh, which is uh, the city has a population of about 700,000 people. It's about the size of Boston, has a large concentration of universities and a vibrant youth sector. And so for the last six months, uh, in collaboration with a Romanian-based research team and also with the, with the foundation that I mentioned, I've been exploring the structures of multi-sector collaborative governance on the city scale and trying to understand where alternative logics are being experimented with and deployed. So, so far we've interviewed over 40 people in government, uh, academia, civil society, and the private sector twice, and I'll explain a bit that, uh, more about that in a second. What we're beginning to see in Cluj is a tension between local government's concept of itself as reformer of a post-communist system and civil society's concept of itself as connector. But each is paying significant attention to the complexity of aligning relationships and the slow process of building trust between stakeholders and the need for better mechanisms with which to do this. <clears throat> so instead of focusing on individual tools for a transaction, there is increasing attention in Cluj to emerging models of collaboration, which is represented well by one particular effort that I wanna talk about, which is the Urban Innovation Unit is a non-governmental R&D program aimed at strengthening collective action in response to the city's strategic challenges. This unit sits inside the Cluj Cultural Center, which is a consortium of over 20 organizations in the city. And now the Urban Innovation Unit is working in parallel with the Center of Innovation and Civic Imagination, 
which is a newly created unit that exists within the municipality. So what's fascinating about this example is that these two organizations, one in government and one without, are working as a mirror image of the other. They have du duplicative staff, which enables them to both operate in a nimble extra governmental structure, while at the same time working within government with all the access to direct service provision that that enables. They are focused on building out new mechanics of civic participation, ones that would not have been possible from within government, as people still tend to distrust government, especially on the national level. As such, they had the foresight to develop this unit outside of government with a plan to transfer it fully to the municipality in 2022. So what I'm seeing in Cluj is a self-perception of multi-sector work that is unique, and attention to the mechanisms of governance in and out of government with all the messiness that entails, and a desire to learn from it, while it is far too early to report on any substantive findings from this research, the novel governance structures being built in the secondary city are well worth paying attention to. So I wanna say a bit about methods here. So in order to understand how people see themselves within these collaborative structures and how they might understand the experience of playing in institutional context, we're actually using novel research methods to capture additional insights. So during each of the interviews, I have two to five artists sitting in to creatively document the process. Uh, within two weeks of the interview, we share the completed artwork with the interviewee. Uh, and then we have a follow-up interview to get their reaction and interpretation of the creative representation. So the use of art in qualitative research opens up spaces of interpretive play. The first interview, oops, the first interview, I asked people what they think. The second interview, I ask people what they think about someone else's representation of them. Art is filled with ellipses, and when incorporated into social scientific methods, which offers a capture device to learn from its generative discourse, it can be Talmudic in design. This method creates productive spaces for interpretation and self-reflection that would have otherwise been impossible. People respond to the way they are represented, the imagery used, the emotional suggestions of the artwork. They see themselves at a distance, creating a space of strangeness that begs for interpretation. Some other art that uh, emerged from these interviews. This is one of my favorites. Um, represents a man walking down a dark, uh, a dark hallway and then battling a bureaucracy monster um, that uh, elicits quite remarkable um, conversation. And I will say, actually, um, I'll just briefly back up to um, to these images. Um, and these are these are of two different people. And what's interesting about these images is that they they create all sorts of dialogue in the person that um, that that this represented. So now they are able to see themselves. Uh, they're able to see the way that they interact with all the pieces of the puzzle that they've mentioned. And a lot of people um, felt, again, with the sort of ambiguity of this of these particular representations, um, became it was in incredibly uh, constructive and generative as they talked about their their sense of self within this emerging ecosystem. So let me um, let me come full circle to play now and conclude. When I talk about my work, people sometimes mischaracterize my interests as gamification. As I hope I have made clear in this talk, I'm not interested in gamifying public life. Gamification, which is the incorporation of game elements into non-game systems, typically has the effect of increasing efficiency, motivating one's path to predetermined goals. I am concerned with games only insofar as they are model systems to enable meaningful play. And as such, they become a useful metaphor through which to understand the transformation of cities and urban governance. So let's return to the example with which I started this talk. When we think about the crisis in Minneapolis, the question is not how can we design a game about police violence and systemic racism? The question is how can our systems of urban governments accommodate the needs and interests of multiple publics by enabling them to explore, discover, and augment the systems that contain them? This is the key question for smart cities. 
And the only way we answer it is by looking at the logics guiding institutions, not only the individual policies or programs. This is my smart city agenda, an agenda I call the civic smart city. At a moment when emerging technologies are transforming every aspect of everyday life, from how we live to where we live and how we live together, Research and design interventions need to be directed at the logics of the mediating institutions such that appropriate forms of governance can emerge to meet the demands of the governed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Um, so we want to maybe if we, if you unshare, Eric, you could. Um, I'd like to invite everyone, if you're a panelist, uh, just raise your hand and um, we'll take your question or use the hand raising feature under participant. If you're a guest, feel free to ask a question in the Q&A, uh, the Q&A um, piece. Um, I know it usually takes people a while to fire up, so I want to start, I, I'm really intrigued by the, um, the work in Romania. And I'm wondering, um, was there anything particularly surprising either in what the artists produced or in the ways that the interviewees engaged with, a, with that production? Are you, are you speaking specifically about the methods, Scott? Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's been really exciting to, to do. Uh, it's been, um, it's been a learning a learning curve as as uh, we uh, figure out how best um, how best to do it. So let me I'll tell you what was surprising. We have I think twelve different artists that are part of this group called Art of History. It's an artist collective in Cluj. Um, they're they're mostly students and um, and so what we do is when we when we have an interview we coordinate the artists and they and you know we have two to five as I mentioned come in and sit in. Um, and, uh, and what, what's interesting is that all the artists have different styles, right? Of course. And so there's nothing particularly scientific about the approach. Uh, it's all the artists have different styles and some of them are much more representational than others. And some of the artists are, do kind of, you saw, you saw a couple, right? You saw the sort of comic style and then there was, uh, you know, then the, the, um, the other style that was much more somber. Um, and, and then there's some were even more representational than that, more like, um, you know, kind of infographs. And what I found, um, perhaps not surprisingly, because of everything, based on everything I said today, but what I found is that the greater the ellipses, the greater the conversation, right? So when you clearly say for people, here's an infographic, here's what you just said, and, and you do the thing that we do in social science, which is member checking, we say, what do you think about the thing that we think you just said? And then, you know, they say like, good, you know, that's good, maybe I change that detail. That's mildly interesting. But when you have something with a bunch of ambiguity in it, tons of ellipses in the, in the representation, then all of a sudden people fill those gaps with their interpretation. And then what we get from that um, is this kind of remarkable conversation about their sense of self. Like so many, many of the people that we interviewed have talked about, um, uh, you saw in, in, in some, of those inter, uh, some of those images of the sort of um, the men that were, you know, kind of big and looking over the city, um, people respond to that. And what's interesting is that people were like, I don't see myself that big in this ecosystem. Um, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm uncomfortable being re represented that way. Why am I looking down? You know, like there's all sorts of things about, uh, about the, the kind of ambiguity in that, in that, um, that again, gets me to my questions, which is how does this multi-sector uh, collaboration actually take place? How do people actually work together? How do they see others within their, their collective goals? And how, can, how are they reimagining governance? Um, and, we, and I can ask them that. And that's, again, mildly interesting. But when we get it in this sideways way, um, all of a sudden our, our, um, our responses can be far more interesting. So that's been really just uh, delightful, actually, in this project. Have you uh, started to think about a framework for sort of um evaluating the responses, um, or is it too early for that? Yeah, it's kind of too early for that because it's so, um, it's so emergent, like it's uh, even the method. I mean, I, again, I'm familiar with, with 
you know, photo voice and other sorts of uh, other sorts of methods that one uses to elicit, um, you know, representation from people that you are are talking to. Um, but I, this isn't this. I'm not. I'm, I'm not pulling directly from an existing method that I know of. So if anybody knows of something that's 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 aligned, I'd love to hear about it. Um, and so I am just. It, I am. It is a bit emergent how how we're going to understand that. I mean, I'm. It's it's all interpretive at the moment. I mean, we're coding everything, so we're going to be looking for. We're still looking for. Um, you know, uh, we're looking for aspects of of. Of, again, collaboration, self-perception, um, and and decision making. Like those are the main sort of themes that we're looking for. But they and they're getting at it in different ways, and we're coding and we're coding for that. Cool. Thank you. Um, so we do now have some people lined up with questions. I think we'll take the questions from the uh, panelists first in order, and then we'll take the questions from the Q and A. So. Um, uh, so whoever raised their hand first should uh, feel free to just unmute and ask the question. Um, I see two of you there. I didn't see who was first. I can bounce first if we sure. just need someone to go. Uh, hi, I'm Mel Sauter. I'm a CMS alum. And oh, and you're muted too. I'm muted. Hi, uh, I did. Hi. I fixed it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mal Sutter. I'm a CMS alum and currently an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. I've also done a lot of um, writing and research on the Sidewalk Toronto project. Uh, and I was really interested in sort of the idea of inefficiency, specifically deployed in a political and policy context, because the one of the major criticisms of the Sidewalk Toronto project was that the procurement process that the RFP had gone through to create the opportunity for that project was, you know, according to many critics, myself included, uh, wildly corrupt and compromised and therefore deeply efficient for sidewalk. <laughs> like it was very efficient for what they wanted to do. And so I'm, I'm interested in approaching the concept of inefficiency from perhaps more of a work to rule perspective and simply a matter of actually enforcing existing policies. And so I'm wondering if the projects that you have going forward sort of interface with that at all, either through like responses to corrupt to, to corruptions in existing policies or merely adding more more layers to existing policies to create that inefficiency. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, it's uh, and, and by the way, you have a you have a chapter in, in the in my civic media book. So I do. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Which Hello. I love. So yeah, <laughs> hi. Um, so um, so now the, the 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 problem is the policy, right? The problem, and, and so the 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 challenge here and the where where inefficiencies matter is actually in 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 shifting those policies. Like the decision making process in the sidewalk project was already determined; it shouldn't have been. You know, we could have built structures to change the way that those decisions were made. Now, maybe it, maybe it couldn't have been otherwise because of the nature of the project. But but I guess what I'm what I'm and I, I'm curious about your face and I want you to say say something back but um but what it, like the, the issue is not so much we have we have policies the policies are sort of efficient you know it's there's an efficient path towards corruption which is what you just said um, and and we and, and everyone gets in line for that right but the challenge is not simply to disrupt that the challenge is to actually change the way that those decisions get made in the first place which is what we tried to do in the Boston project in the Boston project, I mean, yeah, we had a lot of sort of like playful elements to it, right? But, but at the end of the day, the goal of that project was actually to change how procurement um, get, decisions about procurement get made. It was about changing how value propositions get oriented and where SMART happens. So all of those things were at the core of that project. Um, and so if we get to the point where the fastest, you know, the, the most efficient path is corruption, then it's already broken. And so we have to sort of back up and create some um, inefficiencies in that process to enable that kind of collective decision making to happen. So now explain, explain your face. I, I'll explain my face, which <laughs> I made on purpose. Um, so mm. the, the issues that occurred, and this was eventually brought up before, uh, the F, before an ethics committee, a uh, parliamentary ethics committee, um, was it included allegations such as um, the Waterfront uh, Development Authority had released details of the CFP to sidewalk in advance of releasing them to other bidders, that the 
CFP was actually crafted for sidewalks specifically at the request of the liberal federal government. Like it goes all like it went all the way down. Um, in addition to the fact that the uh, Waterfront Development Authority, which is Waterfront Toronto, was a well-known corrupt development authority in Toronto to begin with and had existed as sort of a very compromised entity for a long time. Um, and one of, so Bianca Wiley, who is sort of the major critic from this perspective, she's the one who knows the most about procurement policies in Toronto and Ontario specifically. Um, but the, her major argument was that it never adhered to the policies that were brought forward. And like, we can have a, you and I can have a long conversation about Sidewalk Toronto because <laughs> I know way too much about it at this point. Um, but so what's interesting to me is the ways in which the inefficiencies that might be implemented might best look like sort of traditionally anarchic or traditionally labor oriented slowdown activities and that type of political resistance. So, you know, one of the, one of the um, distinctions that we make in the book that I didn't mention today in the talk is, that, is the, <clears throat> the difference between a mere inefficiency and a meaningful inefficiency. And that's really important, right? And, what, and, and a mere inefficiency can be can be bureaucratic slowdown, and it can be intentional bureaucratic slowdown, like it, it, all of those things. Um, a meaningful inefficiency is, again, one, one design that can cultivate the, you know, that can cultivate outcomes that are, that are desirable and not, and not simply anxiety inducing. So I think what you're, what you're describing, again, like, I, I guess I would come back to you, and maybe this is a conversation for another time, but I would come back to you and say, like, um, where are like what are the broken pieces prior to the prior to the beginning as you mentioned corruption on the federal level or the national level you know corruption um corruption in the in the development agency all of those things existed um and and also a huge desire to partner with google right that's a, that was a huge win uh for for toronto um so all of those things all of those things took place and and again some of these forces are so large we're not going to be able to mess with them you know that that Google comes in, and, and it's not like we can convince cities not to uh, not to take that deal. Um, however, I think that if if the if the proposition was was posed differently, for example, if we were able to say, no, you know, a smart city is not a, a World's Fair style showpiece, but a smart city has to be located within um, within neighborhoods, right? Like it, it's it's got to be where people live. It has to emerge um, from lived experience. Uh, we have to actually build the capacity to, again to 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 start from a place, not from zero, um, to uh, to learn from the um, and to learn to have that capture device that I that I was talking about. If those were the preconditions, then maybe there would have been mechanisms to say, "No, Google, you can't come in." Uh, and that was sort of our desire when we started Betablocks. And I know that's crazy, but the but the desire in doing this work is to say, like, look, if we establish the rules collectively early on, then we can avoid. Um, some of the problems that we've seen in the past. We can learn from some of these examples. But yeah, but yeah I, I think there's, I, I'd love to talk to you more about this. If I could just make one point and then I will stop talking. Um, I yeah. think that the mere inefficiency versus meaningful inefficiency is a super great distinction. And I would actually classify the long-winded uh, co-design process that Google and Sidewalk engaged in in Toronto as a mere inefficiency. Like it was clear that nothing that came out of those meetings was ever going to have an impact on anything um, versus other types of meaningful inefficiencies that might have been implemented like at the city council level or other levels. Thank you, Laura. Great. Thanks, Paul. Hi, Eric. Great presentation. Um, so my question is more in terms of the general reception of play or what your experience has been in terms of the reception of play as a concept. And I first was thinking about this when you showed us the blob. Um, and then uh, also later, you know, when you were um, showing us the representations by the artist. And when we were looking at the blob, there uh, were predominantly, I mean, there were, there were people of all ages, but it did seem to focus much more on children or maybe young adults. Um, and I don't know if that's just because it was this really big colorful, colorful object, but I think that that's part of kind of what this question is about is, is um, is the idea of play, is that stratified by age? And um, does that ever come across as, do people kind of trivialize the idea of play uh, and 
is that ever a roadblock in kind of how you're um, trying to facilitate these conversations, particularly when you're presenting the images, I think, of the artist uh, to the people you're interviewing? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yes, um, I've never had to convince, spend any time trying to convince a child to play. Um, so children play um, and, and they see a thing that appears like a play object or even one that doesn't and, and they will play. Adults, not so much, you know, and, uh, and, and so for adults, there is a, there is a, um, a stage of convincing um, because, you know, one of the things that play does is that it, 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 it levels the playing field, right? If um, in, in play, in, in play conditions, you know, there's, there's supposed to be uh, equality um, or at least in game conditions. Um, and so what's, what's interesting here is that, so I've done, an, I've done a lot of projects that involve play that have sort of high level decision makers. And, and, I've, and some of these projects that have happened in, you know, in say like in, in countries in Asia where there is much more of a sort of strict hierarchy involved in, in, um, in how these things take place. And what's interesting there is if you have a boss with, uh, with an underling in a situation where you introduce play, um, the boss is usually very unwilling uh, to play, you know, the, because that would, that would suggest uh, a kind of giving over to the possibility that they may not be on a higher level than the other people that they're playing with. So, and I think the same is true for generation. You know, it, it certainly plays out generationally. So back to beta blocks. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we learned uh, in, in putting that blob out. One is that kids are attracted to it, um, would come over to it, and, and uh, the other is that adults were suspicious of it uh, because they thought someone was going to sell them something, right? So, uh, so it was, so people would sort of, you know, very, um, they would be trepidatious, they would walk, they would kind of look askance, like, that's interesting, I'm going to keep walking, I'm not going to go over there. Um, and then we learned quickly, actually, because at, at, at one point we were out there and we <laughs> stupidly, um, I had, um, you know, me and my team were out there with a, with a uh, clipboard, you know, it's like, what were we thinking? Like we were standing in front of it, like with a clipboard to take notes. And like, of course, people were, saw us and ran the other way. Um, so we got rid of the clipboard. Um, and then the other thing that we learned is that the... Um, the the blob was very programmed so there are actually stations around the blob we had designed it for like activities in each of the stations and we thought that was the the way to go um and and again people would look over and they would see that there's a thing and they would be a little bit unsure about how to engage in it um but then one time we were we were actually at fish pier in boston um blob was there during a strangely it was during a fish festival not fish the band but fish the the creatures uh, and uh, and so there was lots of lots of fish and and uh, and food, and then there was there was our blob, and uh, and people would come over and talk about technology with us. Um, but the most use it got was when we had cleaned up our stuff and we had like moved all the tech out of the way and we had, we had like we moved it into the van and the blob was still there, and then it was an unattended blob and then people were climbing on it and jumping on it and like jumping through it and it was like all of a sudden it had a completely different um, use value right and and became a pure play object and then people weren't afraid to move up to it. even adults weren't afraid to go up to it and so I think that was something that, that we learned about you know again play is something that um, you know children are willing players adults you have to convince but when you're introducing play into a into a space where it's unfamiliar um, then you really have to design for for that um, for that uncertain the the, un, the kind of uncertainty that that comes with um, you know entering into an unsafe space. So um, so that's been that's been incredibly uh, intriguing. Um, other times I've I've experienced this this thing um, this this concept of sort of generational divides is that um, you know making creating conditions for 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 um, youth to work with adults, right? When adults feel like they're, um, that, that they'll, they're willing to play as long as they're, as they're enabling a child to play. But if they have to be the primary player, they're less comfortable with that. So they'll, they'll step away from the play experience. So that's, so that kind of intergenerational connection has been a really important learning experience through, through some of my design work. 
Thank you. Um, we have a, a number of thoughtful questions in the QA. Um, and I could read them out loud, but I thought, Eric, Eric can you open the QA easily? Is that in front of you? Because yes. uh, if it's not a problem, it might be better for you to quickly look at them and, and answer them directly. Well, I, I was going to say, it might be helpful to read just because the uh, future viewers of the recording. Oh, OK. Sure, then I'll be happy to read. I just didn't want to sort of like, yeah. yeah. Um, so the first question is, how does the move to a civic smart city and the forms of data and information flow around public policy and decision making sit with parallel developments in media architecture by urban design firms, parens, the physical structure of cities? Are these comfortable alliances? Hmm. Parallel developments in media architecture by urban design firms. I mean, I guess I don't, I'd have to understand the, the example a bit more. I mean, certainly, now look, I mean, I'm, I want to as much as possible use play here as a, um, as a generative constructive space, right? Like that's, that's how I'm understanding play. Now, often, you know, play is used as, as, um, uh, it's used as aesthetic, you know, so we uh, can imagine sort of the, the design of, of sort of, um, uh, you know, kind of Silicon Valley uh, office, office spaces, right, the sort of play aesthetic that, that gets used uh, as a, as a, as sort of a, a theater of, of fun. Um, that's, that's not, a, that's not at all what, what I, what I'm interested in. And I think, and, and I don't know, Eric, if, if this is what you're referring to, but I think that there's, there's certainly in the, in the architecture and the uh, media design or the urban design space, play is an aesthetic. And I think that th that differs from the, the kind of institutional, um, in, in the kind of institutional logics that I'm, I'm trying to direct our attention to. So I wouldn't, I, so I guess to answer your question, I think that is an uncomfortable alliance. Um, and, and, I, and I think I would sort of point to one being an aestheticization of play and perhaps another one not. And maybe this would be a better conversation if I had, if we had an example, and maybe you can put one in the, in the chat, Eric, um, to, to talk about. But we can move on to another question and come yeah. back to that. So um, Barbara Balk asks, what, what, would, what would it take to create connective tissue in Boston for beta blocks to achieve lasting transformation. Ooh, that's a that's a tough question, um, Barbara. That that is, um, you know, it's it's funny. It's with a um, with these with projects like this, right? That are that are prototypical in nature, um, where, you know, I th I think what it would have taken is a is a different approach from the very beginning, um, and uh, my colleague who I think is is here. Um, Listening in, John Harlow um, uh, will, you know, we, we worked on the project together, and one of the frustrations from the beginning was our was was the lack of ability to sort of connect to other um, to other offices within within the city, and um, and so understanding the 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 procedure of institutioning um, is something that needed to happen earlier on, and I think what's interesting is that. Now that that's, this project is completed in Boston, I actually have more faith that it'd be picked up by other cities because it becomes kind of representational um, in, a, in, in perhaps a productive way. So, you know, in the city of Miami is interested in, in, in this um, because, it beca because it's a blueprint for them and they can say, okay, here's how, let's, let's start again. Let's use this blueprint and see what we can go with this. Um, whereas I feel like in the city of Boston, it, it might be harder to do that um, at, at this point. So, so that's my that's my sense of that, and it's also it's interesting. Again, if you if you've done projects like this before, sometimes sometimes they function like conceptual art pieces, right? Sometimes they sometimes at the end the the documentation of the project and the and hopefully the relationships built and the good faith built um, become a a kind of conceptual model um, that 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 uh, sort of energizes discourse, right? And, um, and I feel like at this point, and, I, and I, I don't want that of any project that I, I don't set out to do conceptual art. Um, and, but I also know that sometimes that's what happens. And especially within, within uh, you know, university environments, 
you know, we're, we're good at that. We're good, <laughs> we're good at turning things into conceptual art, maybe. And we're better at that than we are the other. And I'm more interested in, in the other. I'm more interested in the, you know, finding paths to persistence and institutional transformation, which is the goal of the work. But I'm also becoming more comfortable with, with sometimes we'll, we'll pull out of it with some, um, with some conceptual art that can have an impact um, beyond the original location of the, of the prototype. So that's, uh, so I think it's, it's a complicated question, but I, that's, that's as best as I can, I can do at this point. Um, thank you uh, for that question. We, we have from Nicole West Bassoff. Um, she's a PhD student in public policy and SDS at Harvard and works on smart cities. And she says, I often find myself asking questions about what it, what makes it possible to say no to public private partnerships or technology installations versus what it means to bring people to the table to participate in decision making around planning and implementation. An example is uh, this contrast was made plainly evident in the Sidewalks Labs case, as well as, for example, Amazon HQ2 in New York. How do you see the role of, of play in putting no on the table versus in widening participation or just slowing things down? Oh, God, good question. Um, so again, I think this goes back to Maul's question about, about, um, uh, about the, the political power that's involved when, when, when a Google or Amazon comes to the table. You know, getting to know it seems impossible. Um, however, however, um, I do have faith, again, and this is why I'm, 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 I'm you know, I'm, I'm a municipalist, I'm interested in cities. I think cities have, there's, there's a lot to, to gain um, from, from learning from cities. Um, <clears throat> I do think that there is possibility for, um, you know, for cultivating decision-making processes first. So I'll point, to, I'll point to one example in Boston actually, which was the Olympics. Um, you know, when the when the Olympics was was coming to Boston, there was a there was a pretty significant anti Olympic um, uh, movement here uh, in the city that did say no to the Olympics. Now that's different than saying no to Google um, because one is a more direct transfer of cash um, than uh, than the Olympics. But it was certainly it was it was but it was definitely a sort of um, revenue stream that was rejected. So I think it's possible, and that's one, uh, that's that's one possible case. But what I, I guess what I'm saying is that if we, if we had a clearer foundation um, of ways in which municipalities can effectively partner with communities and neighborhoods and groups, if we had that worked out. Now th again, I go back to what um, what both Andrea Campbell and Julia Mejia have have said um, in their in their own governing, which is. Um, which is, you know, how do we, how do we create a, a city government um, that not only looks like um, the people that it's governing, but actually has a different value structure from which to govern, right? That's really what this is after. And can we do that by, um, by building the mechanics of governance uh, in a way um, that, that is that is more participatory, that is more collaborative. Now, this, is hap this happens through mechanics. And so this is what we're doing in my, um, in my class is that we're thinking about these sort of mechanical elements of, of co-creation in, in government. Um, and sometimes it feels really small, right? Like we're, we're, looking at a, we're looking at a particular place in which we can intervene in, um, in the process of decision-making, but this is all about building models for, to change that logic, right? So, um, again, if the model typically in the way that the way that cities say no is through protest, where there are decision makers, then there's a then there's a protest. There's something that rises to the attention um, because of masses of people taking to the streets, and then and then officials are pushed into um, you know changing their decision, right? Like that's often how governance works. Um, is that there, that there's like here we're going to do we're going to make a decision and then uprising and then okay we're going to make a different decision. That's not very effective, right? Um, now it's it, it 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 works temporarily, but as we saw in Minneapolis, um, it doesn't doesn't create models for actually persistent change. What it does is that it, that there's a lot of lip service paid to the to the acknowledgement of the value transformation, but we don't have the structures in order to make decisions differently. We don't have the the structures to make decisions differently about policing, let's say, either in Minneapolis or in Boston. And so again, in the city the city of Boston is also attempting to 
uh, reform um, its policing structure. And we can do that through policy changes. So we can make different rules and we can, and we can make different policies, but until we change the way that policies get made, we're still gonna, we're gonna find ourselves in, this, in, the, in the same old spiral. Um, so, so really good question. I have to believe that there is a path to know, um, but I think that that's, that's a long haul. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a really sort of focusing in on governance structures and changing the way that happens across cities in the United States. And then also learning from um, cities around the world, like Barcelona is a, is a leader in this. We have a question from Hamid Reza Nasiri. Um, thanks for the great talk. I'm curious how you think Allende's project CyberSIM in Chile connects to such multi-sector sector collaborative efforts in governance. One, does that project even come up in the conversation in such co-design settings? And two, what do you think about how that groundbreaking but unfortunately unfinished project can inform these more recent efforts? What a good question. And no, it doesn't come up. Um, it, it doesn't come up uh, as often as it as it should. Um, you know, I, I don't even know how to respond to that question um, because the, the ultimately what, what you're asking is how can we how can we learn from that project? And maybe the answer to that to your to your question is similar to my conceptual art answer, right? Is that is that we 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 learn from these things by by through um, through storytelling, right? This is the this is the the sort of generative discourse of these projects, and all too often these projects will these projects will presumably fail, and then they'll get talked about as a failure, right? So here's another here's another problem. Like you have a project that 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 happens, it fails to do a thing, um, and and two things can happen. It gets buried because it has failed to do that thing. Or the people who are doing the project can't talk about failure because they want to continue getting funding or they want to continue getting support or, or, or do more business. So there's just no room to talk about failure. So we never get to talk about why things don't work. We only get to talk about why things work. Um, and so we don't learn from things. So, you know, so the, the project in Chile is a great example of, of, of a project that um, that failed in certain respects to meet some goals, but not in others. And it doesn't get talked about it enough because we often don't make the room to talk about projects that, um, that can function like conceptual art, that have, that have worked in other ways, that have created relationships, dialogues, networks, that have done all the kind of, um, the, the sort of soft aspects, I guess, if you wanna call it that. Of, um, of, of this work, but we don't have the, the sort of business language to talk about it in most settings. So it's another reason why I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the sort of, if, if, if universities can find a way to sort of move the critical discourse out into other spaces and make room for failure, I think that's another wonderful um, function for universities in this public discourse. Um. Thanks for, thank you for that. Uh, I think the one last thing, um, unless people still, if they'd like to raise their hand, there's still another moment or two, but uh, Eric did expand on his question. Um, the first question, my question is a bit about trying to think of cities as built spaces that have to be undone to develop relationships with their constituents. Um, I'm trying to think of cities as built spaces that have to be undone to develop relationships with their constituents. Hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> it's not a question that you have to answer. Thank you for saving me, Eric. I mean, it's an interesting question uh, because uh, it's, it's true. I mean, it's one of the problems with, um, with the way that cities get built is because um, it's expensive. And, uh, and they get built and there's hesitation to unbuild uh, things uh, that, that are built. Um, and so I think that that's a, you know, it's, it is an issue. And this is why I think there's lots of opportunity in thinking about media spaces uh, or thinking about sort of soft urbanism um, where, uh, where we can, where, where there are possibilities for transformation that don't include um, bricks and mortar or breaking, you know, breaking ground. 
Um, so that's, that's another way to, to think about cities. And, and again, like um, beyond the built environment, uh, I think we have to think about cities institutionally as well, which is another, uh, which is another thing that doesn't necessarily require the raising of buildings um, to transform institutions. It might, I mean, because some, some buildings need to be raised to transform institutions, but I, I think that mostly it, uh, they don't. Tomah, you have a question. Oh, I think I'm better. Why I wanted to ask you a question first. Oh, I think you're the, the I think you're the only. Okay. Sure, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm back. Thomas, well, one first and then the other one. Uh, so I was, thank you, Eric. Uh, I, I assume that different communities have different needs. And when you like do these like workshop in different areas, I'm wondering how the government can fulfill like different needs in the communities or which, like how can they decide like which uh, things can like uh, function for for like m like different communities, let's say. How can governments decide what can function for different communities? Like if like when you create like these different workshops, mm -hmm. I assume that different communities have uh, different needs or like prefer cer certain texts. But like I guess government doesn't have. Uh, enough funding to like you know fulfill different needs so I'm wondering uh, how could they decide which ones are the ones that they will pursue yeah I mean I think the answer is that they shouldn't be deciding on their own uh, which which one to pursue and this is another reason why the why it's so important to, to find mechanisms of collaborative governance right that that um, that when governments are left to make a decision alone um, about where the need is uh, within within any kind of um, any kind of place, those decisions tend to be bad. Um, so when there's opportunities for collaboration, then it, the, the it's it is about sort of um, daylighting some of the concerns that government um, often conveniently ignores, um, and that you know again sort of brings that to the table. So I'll bring I'll I'll bring it back to Cluj. So in Cluj, um, you know the 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 most marginalized populations in Cluj are the Roma uh, and and uh, and Hungarians, um, and and you know and they and they have largely been systematically excluded um, from from governance of all sorts, uh, and in fact the the sort of bias against them is somewhat accepted, right? And so it's so you know in, in some ways it's 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 different than than the discourse in the United States where um, you know, again, at least at least in appearance, um, the, those those biases are not publicly acknowledged most of the time. Um, and so, there in that case, in that case, what that requires is that it requires the resources and the effort to bring people to the table that have been systematically excluded from that table. Um, that it requires will from from um, it requires political will uh, from from government bodies. But once, but. But more so than that, it, it, it requires the mechanisms to accomplish that. So, for example, in, in Cluj, um, you know, the, the mayor is, is um, invested in building, um, you know, in, build, in building uh, integrated housing for Roma populations, which was pretty radical uh, for Romania. And, um, and, you know, and so like that, that, that example is a really sort of interesting one. And now coming from the mayor, it's one thing. It's actually building that's not necessarily going to get it done. What's going to get it done is actually uh, putting in the resources to bring to bring those impacted communities to the table, and that's what's beginning to happen there. And that's what takes time, and that's what you know requires that sort of um, you know that level of trust where you know if you've been asked to come to the table over and over again, and every time you come to the table, your finger gets cut off, you're not going to come to the table anymore. Um, you know, so so if you have a new if you have new leadership, then you have to slowly build that trust with people to say that, yeah, we're inviting you to come to the table and we're actually going to feed you this time. You know, like it's a, a completely different relationship that is that is being built. So I think it, it, it is a it is political will, it's commitment to develop um, to commit resources. Um, and then ultimately it's about it's about the sort of long term trust building that's required. Yeah, Amber, sorry I hadn't seen your hand. Okay, Thomas, if you you're it's your turn now. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering if we think of collaboration as the way for institutional change, I wonder if we should rethink also account, um, delegation and accountability too. Yes, we should, Tomas. Uh, we should <laughs> rethink. Uh, so now again, accountability is an interesting uh, is an interesting question. Uh, accountability tends to suggest uh, a personal accountability, right? That one is one is accountable for for their actions, and in that sense, I think that there's, you know, really interesting literature that looks to sort of transfer, transferring accountability to responsibility. Um, responsibility tends to be more, more it implies a kind of re reciprocity, right? That you're that we're responsible. Um, that when we're responsible to something or to someone, that's that's different than being accountable for our own actions. And I think in, you know it, that 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 governance needs to be able to like yes, we need to rethink governance, but we also need to shift accountability to responsibility. It's not about govern government being responsible to the governed, um, and it's not about the governed being responsible to the government, but it's about a mutual responsibility. That is that is absolutely necessary, and again, a mutual responsibility to one another. Um, and this is this is tied to you know the, the the other thing that I didn't really get a chance to talk much about is is the frame of a care ethic, right? That that you know if we if we start to sort of shift, um, you know, we we, we sh if we move some of this language to um, you know away from say uh, impact and more towards care. Right, then we're, we're realigning priorities by assigning a different kind of value uh, to the work that's happening in cities. And if we, think about, um, if we think about what happens in cities as a kind of mutual network of care, um, and we're seeing some of that bubble up because of the pandemic, right? Where care is kind of rising to the surface is something that people are actually talking about in cities. Um, and so the, 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 can we transfer some of those, some of those bubbling up actions to the values that are that are going to be guiding the systemic change of these institutions, and I do hope like that's that we can start moving a lot of that language into a into a different space. There's a, a book that I haven't I only read the first couple pages of, but it's the Care Manifesto. It just came out. I don't know if anybody's seen that yet, but uh, um, it promises to be um, to be fantastic. I'm going to recommend it before reading it. So there you go. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks. I think we. Um... Obviously, we're coming near the end of time, but uh, we do have one more question in the QA, so I thought I'd, uh, for those who can stick around, from the perspective of municipal government, how should they measure the effectiveness or performance or otherwise evaluate the products of meaningfully inefficient projects? And is there a risk of missing the point? Yeah. In doing that, uh, Yeah, what a great question. Um, yes. Indeed, and this this is um, this is how like in a in a in a culture of evaluation, um, and you know, in a, in a need for for measuring impact. Yes, we have to change the conversation about about this. Um, I'll bring up a um, we uh, I, I developed a, with um, with colleagues a a tool called Meter, which is M E E T R, um, and it's M E E T R. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, Actually, here's um, so uh, so that so I develop a, a tool called Meter, which is specifically about evaluating different kinds of questions. Um, and and so in in what Meter does is that it looks to it looks to create a kind of reflective evaluation process for practitioners so that they can understand um, along two primary axes that they 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 can understand their work along social infrastructure, uh, building strong social infrastructure and longevity. Um, and so, and, and we do that by, by um, uh, breaking down four activities, and these are described in the Meaningful and Efficiencies book, but four activities, uh, including network building, holding space, um, distributed ownership, and persistent input is what we call them. Um, and these activities are, are, as we describe them, these are the, this is the work that people are actually doing in order to accomplish uh, the, the kind of goals that I'm describing. And so the challenge is we're not going to get anywhere if we continue to measure the same things that we've long been measuring. Um, that we have to start measuring different things and sometimes that what those things are are these um, mostly invisible practices that people are engaging in in order to, to, to transform their, their organizations or their places. Um, and so, yeah, so, I, so I, I'm very interested in this problem. Um, and like I said, we've developed this tool, this is being used 
Um, this is being used by um, by journalism journalism organizations. Uh, it's being used by, um, by by folks in cities. I'm actually we're all using it for um, my some of my active research projects. In fact, in Cluj, we're having the um, the practitioners that we're working with use the meter tool to self evaluate their own practice so that we can begin to get at a different kind of metric um, for um, you know for understanding the value of this work. So I think along with sort of changing the language that that you know Tomas was talking about, um, in order to change the language, we actually have to change the criteria um, by which we evaluate these things. Um, and so that's it has to be a parallel practice. So I appreciate the question. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, obviously, Eric, I thought this was great. Um, and, and clearly there was, lot, there was lots of interest in what you had to say. So um, really glad you were able to do this and thank everyone again for coming this week. Um, look forward to seeing everybody next week, same time. Thanks very thank much. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.